Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Apollo 14 is a mission which I've discussed several times before. It was, of course, a pivotal moment in the Apollo program as they tried to put the program back on track after the disaster that was Apollo 13. It was crewed by Alan Shepard, who was making his second space flight after becoming the first US uh, astronaut in space. It also had Ed Mitchell and Stuart Rusa, and on the surface of the moon, it was going to see some of the greatest feats of human sportsmanship where uh, Alan Shepard whacked a couple of golf balls, uh, well, probably world record distances at the time, and uh, Ed Mitchell threw the nearest thing he could find and said that it looked like a javelin. Uh, yeah, obviously that was pretty awesome. Those two also became the first computer hackers in space when, with the help of Don Ailes back on the ground, they managed to hack the Gibson, sorry, uh, AGC and make it bypass an abort switch was sent, which was sending spurious signals and therefore save the mission. But I want to talk about a more passive participant in this flight. Stuart Rusa had brought along a small cache of seeds, tree seeds. And the reason he brought this along was partly as a science experiment and partly as a symbol of life on Earth and probably as a token that harkened back to what he had done two decades before he had become an astronaut orbiting the moon. Now, astronauts are generally understood to be all-round badasses. They're combat veterans, they're test pilots, some of them have you know, degrees and PhDs in engineering, and astronautics, aeronautics, but Stuart Rusa had one of the coolest backgrounds. He was what's called a smoke jumper. Now, if you don't live in California or a fire prone area of the world, you might know, not know what a smoke jumper is. So yeah, I live, I'm surrounded by trees, we have to deal with the potential of wildfires. I mean, literally, right now there's a fire burning like 20 miles in that direction that's blowing smoke in this direction. That's the Kincaid fire. Today we had a fire in the Marin Headlands where they were dumping a you know, fire return on it. But one of the things about how you fight wildfires is you have to stop their progress and you have to contain them. And a lot of this isn't so much done with people with water and fire retardant. It's done by people on the ground cutting fire breaks. And sometimes to get to the best places to cut the fire breaks, you have to take extreme measures and you have teams called smoke jumpers that get in and they literally parachute into a burning landscape. And then, they cut the fire breaks. They bring along you know, 50 kilograms of gear per person. They will cut ditches, take down trees. They will save the day. It's a high stake job and it is incredibly dangerous. And the people that do it are legitimately badasses, which probably makes Stuart Russo one of the most badass astronauts, even though he spent all, he spent all this time in space rather than landing on the moon. But regardless, yeah, this was an experiment that was done in collaboration with the US Forestry Service. He brought all these seeds up to space where they spent three days orbiting the moon and then they brought them back to Earth. Now, originally there was going to be some more detailed analysis, but apparently the seed container broke and the, the seeds got all mixed up. So the Forestry Service sent the seeds out to their sort of research areas in, uh, I believe it was in Mississippi and in Placerville, California, and they planted them and saw what would happen. Well, guess what? They all actually were totally unperturbed by their flight in space. They hadn't invent uh, inherited any Fantastic Four-like powers, unfortunately, because it would be really cool to have some walking, talking trees, I guess. But um, yeah, after a few years, they decided that the, tr uh, the trees were fine, they had collected the information, and so the Forestry Service had a bunch of really cool moon trees. What did they do? They gave them out to anybody that wanted them. So a couple of them ended up in Berkeley, there's uh, three of them up at Humboldt University in Arcata, there's some in Monterey, there's one uh, that was planted at the White House which actually died. Um, yeah, they're all over the US and there's some in some other countries. So I want to go and find a moon tree. Okay. Okay, Dudley Shield Fern, Oregon Gold Thread, 722. We're looking for beds 723, so it must be somewhere around here. 
Western Mock Orange Mount Vista something or other bed 723 there we have it Sequoia Sempervirens moon tree the seed which from which this tree sprang was taken to the moon and obviously taken back now do you want to know how big it's got in 50 years well let's uh, try not to fall over here it's uh, doing pretty well for itself. Oh my goodness. This keeps going up and up and up and up and up. It's, it's up somewhere. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Uh, if, if you told me this thing had been part, you know, planted less than 50 years ago, I would not believe you because you get like older ones just sitting there about the same height. That's like utterly ridiculous. Maybe it picked up some amazing moon mutations while it was in flight this is this is kind of cool so this was taken by Stuart Rusa to the moon okay at this point I have to kind of pause the science for a minute because uh, there is an ulterior motive for this you might have heard of a guy called Mr. Beast he's a youtuber that's apparently very popular with the kids. He has about 25 times as many followers or subscribers as me and when he reached 20 million subscribers he sort of committed to planting 20 million trees which is bold move, way more than I think he can reasonably do. So he has gone and put out this call, he's asked all his YouTube friends and well me obviously as well, I'm not sure where I am on that scale, to kind of encourage everyone's followers and subscribers to help them on this. He's assembled a giant team of tree people, they call them Team Trees. So if you go to teamtrees.org you can commit to planting trees or you can actually just give people money to plant trees because apparently having more trees in the world is a very good thing. So yeah, you should actually check that out right now. I was convinced by, you know, Smarter Every Day, Mark Rober, people that I'm very, very much down with their work on YouTube. So uh, I'm definitely in on this as well. And I'm going to say, yes, I know I have a lot of followers who um, you know, come from different parts of the country, have different politics. Some of you might dismiss this as a sort of lefty liberal California thing. And you're totally valid to have that as your opinion. But I will point out, you could also say that it is an astronaut, test pilot, smoke jumper, firefighting badass thing as well to do. And that's cool as well. Look, I'm not going to, you know, di dictate to you, whatever. Let's get back to the science. So these tr these plants, these uh, trees, they're all over the country. Apparently nobody actually tracked where they went and it wasn't until decades later that David Williams at NASA started trying to compile the locations of these things. Except we've only discovered, you know, dozens, rather there were something like 400 of these trees that were planted over the country and most of them are still unknown. The, that's kind of interesting. So anyway, the other thing is I sort of wondered a lot about the radiation exposure because obviously these things spent several days in space in a higher radiation environment uh, than you would normally get on Earth. And they were seeds as well, which is a very early part of their life cycle. Now, the Apollo missions were obviously designed to minimize the radiation exposure to the crew. So one, one thing they did, for example, is the Van Allen belts are most intense along the equator. So the trajectories they took to the moon flew up over the top of the belts so that they minimized the dose. But even then, they still got more radiation than the normal people. However, yeah, grown up people, they were mostly fine. What could it do to a seed? Well, I actually went and I found an expert. There's uh, someone called Nicole Kaplan. I met her at ESA. She previously actually studied radiation effects on plants in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Different kind of radiation for sure, but uh, I asked her for her opinion and there was a few things she said. First of all, she says that the early growth stages are unanimously agreed upon to be the most radiosensitive time for plants. But a lot can be said for the, set, for the radio uh, protective properties of seed coatings and low water content for plants that haven't yet germinated. You see, she goes on to say that radiation 
One of the main ways that it affects living organisms is that it causes water to be split, to be hydrolyzed into you know, hydrogen and hydroxyl ions, and those then attack nearby proteins or DNA. Seeds are actually very dry and so they have much, much lower levels of water. They're waiting for that water to come along so they can germinate. So that actually serves to protect them, right? Um, the seed coating also acts as a shield, but terrestrial plants have actually got pretty good protective systems in general. The, now where is it? They have a highly efficient antioxidant mechanism that basically mop up those free radicals. And they're much more efficient than the ones that we find in uh, mammals and uh, humans, right? So if the radiation dose is low enough, these, uh, high, these um, free radicals are continuously mopped up. So only when the radiation level gets high enough do you have to start worrying about serious levels of exposures. And of course, we do have things like atomic gardens where the exposure levels were high enough that you would get these effects being triggered. But this trip around the moon probably didn't do anything of any consequence. So thanks to Dr. Kaplan for that insight. Anyway, the trees are obviously healthy. The one I looked at was very, very tall. And it's also, it's not just that they are healthy, but they are happily reproducing with their neighbors. It's not, we now have second and third generation moon trees that have been documented. So these things are living and thriving and surviving and carrying a little bit of the essence of the moon back to Earth in tree form. And that's great. So yeah, moon trees, <laughs> another cool little corner of the Apollo program that you might not have heard of. And of course, if you're interested in helping Mr. Beast with this thing, go and check out teamtrees.org or uh, you know, go and watch some of my other videos about you know, nuclear weapons and stuff. It's all cool. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.